And instead of having another sermon this morning, we're going to look at The Walking Dead. Okay, it's going to be season two, episodes 13, 14, and 15. So turn in your media devices right now to the, to the channel of Colossians 2, 13, 14, and 15. And we're going to look at how Paul is exposing the faults of the walking dead. Um, and we're looking at um, Christ's power to forgive the dead. And um, he's, he's telling us, first off, in, this, in the chapter that he's already started in one, about the cosmic Christ. And I never heard this term before, but he's talking about these grand things such as um, mysteries made manifest and coming out of darkness into light and powers and principalities and kingdoms and this, this huge work that Christ has done. <clears throat> and um, so Paul has, is writing to this young church in Colossae, to the Colossians, and it's, he's writing from prison. It's about 63 AD or so, give or take a year. And typical for Paul, he's trying to do something with this epistle, and he wants to refute, what would you guys say? <laughs> you wouldn't say anything? You're absolutely right. He's refuting heresy, which, was, which is what he does in a lot of his, um, in, in his epistles. So what's happening culturally that's going on is there's some Judaizers who have infiltrated the church. They're trying to get people to return to Jewish customs, one of them being circumcision. It's also a, a Hellenistic area in Phrygia, which is kind of opposite than the Romans who are really into... Um, the whole debauchery and, and all that. The Hellenists, from what I understand, tended to be more of the, the legalists and that they spiritually believed the material was unimportant and actually hindered your spiritual life. So they would impose upon the flesh and meet the flesh with asceticism um, so that they could get to a higher spiritual plane. So all these influences starting to hit upon the church. And Paul's reminding us that sometimes even though the, the, um, the people are saved in the church or we're saved, we can return to our zombie tendencies. <laughs> brains. I want brains. <laughs> and even we do this as Christians sometime, because we'll revert back to the flesh even though we're saved in Christ. <laughs> I don't need prayer today. God, I got this. <laughs> I helped out the old lady. <laughs> oh, that was a good preach today. I'm doing good. Brownie points. Brownie points. And so sometimes we have these same tendencies that he's seeing in the church here in Colossae. So we're going to look and and this stuff, the way Paul explains it, the way I understood it, is that it stinks like rotten flesh um, because that's just what it is. It's our rotten flesh trying to replace God's work and what he's already done. So we're going to be looking at three things today, three facts about how God forgives the dead. It's one, who Christ is, two, what he's done, and three, how he's done it. And then looking at these things, we no longer have a fear that we need to return to our old religious habits and rituals. So if somebody could read for me, if you have Colossians open, verse 13, chapter 2, season 2. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Thank you. So we're going to be looking at who Christ is in this. And it's a really interesting construction because he starts with the subject, you, talking to the church. But then he goes on, and all the verbs are in the passive phrase about um, being dead, being made alive. And actually, he's showing that Christ is the agent of the things already done inside of you. Um, that he's forgiven our trespasses, that we used to be dead. But the most important thing here, and this is really exciting, is that he's sneaking in the deity of Christ in here, which he does throughout all of his, his epistles, especially um, throughout Colossians, throughout Ephesians, in Corinthians, and also in 1 Timothy, he's saying that Christ is God. And the way he does it is according to Jewish culture at this time, one of their definitions of God is he who raises from the dead, or he who brings the dead to life. And Paul uses this um, over and over again in his epistles in reference to Christ. So here he's saying that Jesus is God. 
and he's telling us that because God has the, because Jesus has this power and has forgiven us, we don't need to slosh around in sin anymore. We don't need to be separated from God. And what's interesting is he's already told them, you've been dead in the past, and you've been doubly dead for two reasons. Because of your trespasses, you've been in sin, you've been separated from God, and you've been without hope. And he's saying also that because you've not been part of the circumcision, you've not been part of the Jews, you haven't had God's promises available to you, you've been doubly dead. So he's emphasizing how dead they were in the past, but now how Christ has made them alive. So what he's showing here is just the way he structured it so that even the verbs are passive, meaning they've already submitted to Christ, that they don't have to be looking to themselves and to their own flesh, but they can refocus toward God. So we've looked at who Christ is as God with the power to forgive. Now we're going to look at what Christ did, and that Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, has the power to forgive the dead. Verse 14 having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Here he's using three verbs. He's using wiped out, taken it out, and having nailed it. So Paul is very emphatic in this short passage of scripture where he keeps overemphasizing things. And it's really interesting too, he's using a technique of metaphors here. He'll build a metaphor and then he'll stop and then he'll cut it off and switch to a new one. And I understand from Jewish tradition, that was the way of getting someone's attention, was to start a story and then change it so that it's, there's a twist and what you expect to hear is something different than what Paul says next. What's interesting about um, being wiped out, which is the first verb, is that it's the um, the, the same word that they use for like when you erase an answer on a quiz or you erase something that you're writing, you, you scrub it out. And then the second verb, that he's taking it out, it's kind of like even more powerful than Tony Soprano taking you out. It's like it's obliterated in the universe is the sense of the word. And then finally, um, having nailed it to the cross is a public denouncement. It's saying this thing wasn't done in private, but this was done publicly. That not just all the world and every man can see, but all the universe could see that the work was done and completed. And what he's nailing to the cross isn't our sin, it isn't the law. In, in this reference, it isn't even himself, but it's the writ of accusation against us. It's the condemn, condemnation order for us to die that Christ is, is denouncing. I remember one time when I was um, driving home from the gym and I was going through West Hollywood, and I flew through a red light. You know, and it's kind of like, oh, I think I just saw something red there. And it was late at night, there wasn't any other traffic, it was a small side street. And then, of course, I see something blue in my rear view mirror. Yeah. The cops pull me over, and I figured, okay, gotta be a good boy. You know, I'll do the secret policeman's handshake. So I roll down the window, grab the steering wheel, the cop comes up to the car, and he says, do you know that you just went through a red light? And I'm like, yeah, what? Something like that. He goes, can I see your license? And I, I go to reach for it, and I realize it's not my sweatpants. It's in my dress pants, in my wallet, in my gym bag, on the passenger seat. And uh, I know I'm not supposed to take my hands off the steering wheel. So I said, this is where it's at. Is it OK to get it? And there's this long pause, this awkward pause, where the police officer doesn't say anything. And I mean, I didn't know if he thought I had gun in my bag. I mean, I don't look like that type of guy. Or if he, he was just appreciating the respect that I was giving him. And he goes, okay, just go home, remember this, and don't do it again. And he let me off for running a stoplight. I've never heard of that. $450 ticket. Um, a month's worth of uh, DVD, uh, uh, DMV uh, classroom training. Um, what else? Oh, hiking my insurance rates. And he just let it go because he had the authority to do that. And this is the same authority that Christ has when he erased it, when he obliterated it, the charges against us, when he nailed it to the cross. So we've looked at what we've looked at who Christ is, what Christ has done. Now we're going to look at how Christ did it. So not only does Christ forgive the dead, he has the power to forgive the dead. We're looking at how he yeah, how his power to forgive us, the dead, also frees us from the snatches of this world. So verse 15, 
Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. And now again, Paul's using three verbs. He's being very emphatic. And the first one is he's using is disarm. Now I always thought disarm, like when I grew up in the 60s, there was the Cold War, and we talked about disarmament of nuclear weapons. And so I, that's what I always thought about for meltdown. But this, this word disarm is only used two other times in scripture. It's used in verse 11 right before this, and it's used in chapter 3, 3, and 9. And what it means is to disrobe. And so if you look at chapter 3, verse 9, it says that you guys have done these things and you've done those things, but you have put off the flesh. Right. right. You put off the flesh. You put on the old man. So you've taken it off is literally what this verb says. And then you put on the new man. Now one of the commentaries I was reading also says that um, it, it has so that it has the sense of this blanket of condemnation being over the whole universe and that Christ came along and he disrobed it. He took it off the universe and threw it aside. And it wasn't like Star Wars, like where you're fighting good and evil and it takes a, a triptych of three trilogies to tell the whole story about how good finally wins. It's like, no, Christ threw it off like it was a garment with holes in it. It was no effort for him at all. And then when you look, this is really cool too, when you look at verse 11 in chapter 2, it says that, um, and you have cast off the deeds of the flesh, thanks for the circumcision of Christ. And what that word means is that you've thrown away the zombie force. You've, you've cast it off like nothing because you don't need that zombie force yet anymore. So that's disarming the principalities. Then he made a public spectacle of them. Excuse me, I'm dry. And that's um, an, a denouncement, not just of the act that was against us, but the source and the origin of where that came from. All the powers of hell are being denounced in that. Um, last week in the UK news, there was a LinkedIn lawyer who was being sexually harassed by another guy online. And so she tweeted it to the, to the whole world. And it caused quite controversy when people started siding with this girl and siding with the guy because they, she was exposing him in a very almost vicious way. Um, and this is more powerful than that. This is kind of like God's tweet to the universe of denouncing these powers. And then finally, the last verse is that he triumphs over them in it and in him. So how do we know that God has triumphed over all these powers? It's through what event? And what came after that? It's the power of his resurrection. So this <clears throat> triumphing has a sense of um, all the expansive things about the cosmic Christ that Paul has just been talking about. And some of your manuscripts you may be reading have triumphed over them in it or in him. You can take it either way, whether it means the power of the resurrection or whether it means Christ and all the actions that Christ has done up to now. So that God has been so powerful up here, he's reminding the Colossians, why are you worried about circumcision and all the Jewish rites down here? Do you really think your measly efforts can do something better or bigger than what Christ has already done for you, that you're turning back to religion. And sometimes we have that same tendency to look in at ourselves and to look in at our efforts. And we forget the bigness of Christ. But he wants to show us that his power brings us alive in him, banishes our shame, and bans all those forces that were against us. So Christ has the power to forgive us the walking dead. And that power frees us from the snatches of this world, all those old tendencies that we would easily fall back into. And that his resurrection has delivered us from darkness, death, and decay. And he's brought us into light, life, and living with him. So let's set our focus upward toward God. That's Paul's solution for the problem is, OK, you got the problem of returning to religious ritual. Look up to Christ. Refocus yourselves again, because Christ's power to snatch you out of the world. And then elsewhere in Scripture, you know, talks about when you see these things drawing nigh, when these things begin to happen, when you see these things drawing nigh, look you up. what? Look up. You look up. Thank you, John. <clears throat> or that you run the race that's before you. You've been looking up to who? 
Hebrews, Jesus, the author and the finisher, the perfecter of your faith. So instead of doing this on you walk, uh, brownie points, religion, we lift our hands and we praise God. You have completed it all, Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you. And that's where we put our focus. And I think that's what Paul's telling us to do in these three verses.